Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Hiskins, and I'm the Manager of Learning Services here at State Library Victoria. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the policy pitch tonight, which is a, a joint initiative of State Library Victoria and the Grattan Institute. And it's good to see, too, that a number of you have kept your coats on, because it's a little nippy in here. Um, this seminar is held on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. And I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders and to the elders of any other communities who may be with us this evening. I'd like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speakers, Catherine Henderson, uh, Michaela Epstein, Julie Sonneman, and Megan French, to Grattan Institute members and staff, uh, and friends of the library. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening to welcome you to what will no doubt be an important discussion. Uh, tonight, our panel of experts will discuss how government policies can better support schools and teachers in the classroom. Now, education is something that is very close to our hearts here at, at the library. As Victoria's home of knowledge and ideas, we offer a suite of primary and secondary education programs developed by professionals uh, and aligned with the curriculum. Uh, our team guides students to develop critical thinking and creative research skills as, as they explore the library's expansive collection. And our programs aim to foster curiosity and the love of learning and discovery. Ultimately, we aim to support students in fostering a lifelong connection with the library. Now, the library is also, with the Koshland Innovation Fund, a partner in the Australian Learning Lecture. Now, all is a prestigious lecture series bringing big ideas in education to national attention. And each lecture uh, is a catalyst for a two-year program of activity, bringing new thinking to public attention. Uh, the series features the world's leading knowledge shapers to discuss the biggest issues facing education and learning today. We recently published, and here I have it, um, Sir Michael Barber's lecture on joy and data from the inaugural All Cycle, along with a set of kicks, uh, six case studies. Uh, and these examine how data gathered through the use of diagnostic tools in real learning experiences can provide uh, greater insight to improve student learning. And this is relevant because uh, one of these looks at the use of Maths Pathway, and we have Michaela from Maths Pathway here today, and particularly as a response to the challenge outlined by uh, Pete Goss and Jordana Hunter's Grattan report from 2015 on uh, targeted teaching, and the fact that achievement can be spread over five year to eight year levels within a single class, which is a, a significant challenge. Um, now, that report is available on the Australian Learning Lecture website, which is all-learning.org.au, and I've got some hard, hard copies here if anyone was interested. Uh, come and see me later. So, advertisement over. Back to tonight's uh, event. Um, there is much to unpack in regarding David Gonski's recent report on Australia's schooling system. And I'm sure everyone here is keen to explore how to, uh, we can make improvements in school education with tonight's panel discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this evening, Megan French. Uh, Megan is the marketing manager for, for Grattan and the producer and host of the Grattan Institute podcast. Her previous roles in Melbourne have focused on event management, particularly in corporate environments, as well as brand management, uh, marketing and relationship building. Megan moved to Melbourne in 2012 following a brief stint in Italy, which would be warmer than we are here today. And prior to this, spent five years with the Department of Education in Queensland, primarily as a, as a policy officer. So please join me in welcoming me Megan and our panellists. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders. Um, thank you to the State Library of Victoria for hosting us tonight. We are very lucky to share a great partnership with the library, which gives us an opportunity to bring events like tonight's to you all. Um, at tonight's event, Post Gonski 2.0, our panel will discuss the difficulties of achieving evidence-based teaching at scale and how to implement new critical reforms such as tailored or targeted teaching in light of the findings from David Gonski's new report, dubbed Gonski 2.0. 
So let's meet our panel. To my left is Catherine Henderson. Uh, she's the director of the University of Melbourne Network of Schools, which is a collaborative partnership for Australian schools from all sectors, all stages of schooling and all demographics to learn from each other and to work together with world-class researchers on strategies to improve student learning. Previously, as regional director of the then Western Metropolitan Region in Victoria, Catherine led the region's schools in making significant and unprecedented gains in student learning growth and achievement. Next to Catherine is Michaela Epstein. Michaela has taught and coached math teachers in schools in rural Victoria and in Melbourne, and her expertise in mathematics education extends to curriculum policy and development. In 2014, she was recognised at the ASA Excellence in Professional Practice Conference with an award for her work with Numeracy Intervention Program. Um, she is also currently the Head of Learning at Australian Founded Social Enterprise Maths Pathway, as Andrew mentioned, but joins us tonight in her capacity as President of the Mathematical Association of Victoria. Finally, on stage tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, School Education Fellow, Julie Sonneman. She has significant experience in education policy and system design and has co-authored several high-profile Grattan reports on effective teaching, professional learning, equity and funding. She has over 10 years of experience in school education policy, working within government, consulting and research organisations, and has studied high-performing school systems in East Asia and North America. Please join me in welcoming our panel tonight. So we'll begin this evening with a detailed discussion from our fa fabulous panel for around 40 to 45 minutes, followed by 20 minutes or so for you, our audience, to ask some questions of the panel. Uh, finally, if you'd like to contribute to tonight's conversation outside of question time, you can do so using um, on Twitter using hashtag policy pitch and the handles at Grattan Inst and at Library Vic. Okay, let's get this panel working. Um, Julie, I will start with you. Can you give us an overview of the context of the Gonski 2.0 report? Um, so for those who haven't read the report, um, Gonski 2.0 is about um, how to improve school education outcomes, which is very different to the first Gonski report, which is about um, how much money we should be allocating to certain schools. Um, and in, in looking and sort of judging the Gonski 2.0 report, I think it's really important to look at the context because um, the reason why the Gonski 2.0 review was commissioned was at a time when the Commonwealth Government had promised um, a whole bunch of extra money to go into school education and they wanted to be able to ensure that that extra money was going to be spent well. Um, and they commissioned it right in the middle of a funding negotiation um, with the state and territories, which is for the next 10 years and is due to be wrapped up in September. So they used the review as basically a way to look at how should extra money be spent well in schools and they were going to use the findings of the review to then influence the funding negotiations with the states and territories. Um, now anyone who's had anything to do with Commonwealth state relations in Australia knows that it's incredibly fraught um, and uh, in incredibly um, unproductive process at the best of times. Um, and from some of the signals that were being given at the time, um, it looked as though there was a bit of a danger that the Gonski um, process could be used as a way for the Commonwealth to intervene more heavily in schools if the, if the Gonski review was to come back with some really prescriptive recommendations about what needed to change. Um, there was a risk that potentially those, those recommendations could be tied very tightly to state governments. Um, so Grattan wrote a report on that um, released it earlier this year, that which really just looked to some of the history about Commonwealth state relations in Australia and the successes and failures of when Commonwealth has actually tried to make the states and territories do something. Um, and I think the key finding there was as much as you can try and you can actually force state governments to do things as a Commonwealth, you can't, you can't actually really force them to do it very well. So um, our recommendation was very much that the Commonwealth should stay out of school education to stick to its current areas of responsibility. Um, and when you look at the, the, the thrust of the Gonski 2.0 report, it largely does follow that line of thinking. Um, it has received quite a bit of criticism for being a very high level document. 
um, and it is very, the, the statements and the directions set out in the report are very high level. Um, but I think within, if you consider it within the political context, it, it signals, it, at this point it doesn't signal a really heavy handed um, Commonwealth involvement, which is, which is a good thing. So let's unpack uh, the findings a little bit more then. What did the report find and what are your thoughts on it? Um, so a lot of the directions, as I said, were very high level. Um, a lot of the directions are goals that state governments have had for some time. Um, so it's a very comprehensive document. It covers the importance of effective teaching, professional learning, school leadership, school improvement, many things that you cannot argue with um, and are very sensible at a high level. Um, and I think that to some degree it had there has been a little bit of reaction from state governments of, yep, we already know this, we're doing this, um, and, and that is right, but you've also, I think it's a really good time to reflect then to say, well, if state governments have actually had these high-level directions for some time, why aren't we necessarily seeing evidence-based practice in the classroom still? So I think the document does open up a really good chance to have those kind of more um, reflective conversations at a state government level. Um, there were, having said that, there were a couple of directions in the paper that were new. Um, so there's much more emphasis on student growth rather than achievement and shifting reporting to focus on growth as well. So it was very clear in having a message of one year of growth for every student, every year that they're at school, um, which sounds great to say simply, but that's actually a huge change if we're going to implement that in practice and there's lots of questions about well how would you actually measure that, um, how would you benchmark that um, and uh, so there's a lot that would need to be worked through so um, the focus on growth is a big one. Um, the other, one of the other big announcements was around um, new tools that the Commonwealth would invest in to help teachers measure growth alongside that and also re restructuring the curriculum so that it's presented as learning progressions, which is also a really huge change. So there's this idea that we should move away from a mass model of education where students just sort of move through, through grades to um, really acknowledging the spread that's in classrooms. As Andrew mentioned, there's a, a spread of up to five to eight years in any classroom. So the idea is that teachers would now use learning progressions, which basically are a bit of a roadmap of what students should be able to know and and do um, when they're progressing through their learning. Um, and that teachers can use these learning progressions to visually see and map how students are growing over time. Um, so that, that's, that's a big shift, because that actually means that, for example, a year three teacher now not only needs to know the year three curriculum really well, they, they will need to know the, um, the learning content of, of a year one student, of a year eight student, which that's, there's no change. I mean, the students are still the same, the needs are still the same, but it's just making it a lot more official and we're actually expecting them to do something that's really, that's actually really difficult. Mm. Catherine, I'm, al I'm also curious to get your thoughts on the findings from the report. Um, so I thought I'd just start with, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might just start with a particular example because I was talking to someone at my kitchen table. There's a young man in his 30s. And I said to him, have you ever had any good teachers? He's a carpenter, he's a very successful small businessman, he's bright, he's beautiful, lovely, he's my daughter's partner. So have you ever had any, have you had any good teachers? He said, yeah, I had a fantastic teacher in primary school and she worked out when I was in year four that I couldn't read. And so she made me come to school every Wednesday for an hour before school and she taught me so he could read. So he didn't grow up with the notion that he was a failure at school and couldn't do what you have to do at school. He would have been one of those kids who'd just gone quiet and wandered off, I think. So th that made me think a lot. I think that teacher, we should find her and honour her now. But, and, and Julie, you were talking about the year three teacher has to know the curriculum from early childhood to year 12 probably in some classes, um, and they can't. So. The point I wanted to make about that teacher is she can't do that alone. She cannot take... So I think the figures now for year... Uh, for 2017, in um, year three, 
0.9 per cent of children don't reach the minimum standard. The minimum standard is the minimum standard at which you have access to the curriculum. This is for writing, right? By year three, it's 3.1. By year five, it's 6.9. And by year um, seven, it's 12.9. So 12.9 per cent of all children in Victoria in 2017 failed to reach the year nine writing benchmark. And you can look at, analyse that. Now, that, this data, by the way, is analysed by, to acknowledge her, Dr Misty O'Donoghue. So it, 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 the, the numbers of children in some schools, like and I've worked in the Northern Territory for 10 years and working with schools where no children reach the year three reading benchmark, and we used to cheer when 5% and 10% did. So, you know, some schools, that, but that class still has the range of ability in it that any class has. So we can't expect teachers to take control of this and do it on their own. And there are a number of strategies and methods and ways of supporting teachers, which Gonski's strong about, to collaborate around planning, around assessment, around teaching, around evaluating impact, and around knowing what strategies to use for any particular child. But if we expect them to do it on their own, I mean the actual teaching, they're unlikely to be able to manage it with, a, with the range of levels in the classroom. So, I know we. So, so, so bringing it back to your yeah, thoughts of the so Gonski report. Bring it back yeah. to the Gonski report in this way. There is a complexity and around what a teacher is expected and able to do in the classroom, and there is a strong evidence base of how we can support teachers to do that. And the, the challenge I have, I think Gonski creates possibility because it doesn't um, come down to a prescriptive level. And the challenge I want to put really to the systems, to the Commonwealth and the states is to actually take account of the evidence of implementation. We're all about, we all care, we love little children, we want them to learn. And one of the nice things about education is it's a belief driven system. People who work in education actually want to achieve something with children. But, and there's a, that, that's something that you can tap into and work with. It's also a risk because everybody who works in education from the minister down knows everything about education and wants to control for it because they want to make a difference. So the, the challenge for the Commonwealth and the states, the way I think about it is to get clear around what the levers are at each level to make that difference because the only thing that matters is a change of what's happening with the teachers and the children in the classrooms. And the Commonwealth can't make teachers do things differently. It's not available to them. I actually don't do anything because I'm told to. I think most people don't. So um, <laughs> making people doesn't work. So if you take that strategy and you have top-down um, accountability, basically what Steve Dinham says is you get compliance, but you don't get um, engagement and a creative approach. So what I'm saying is, the Commonwealth, all levels, all levels, including students and teachers, need to be clear what levers are available to them to support teachers being able to collaborate, challenge each other and work together and take responsibility for more than just the children in their class. And so they should be looking at what's their capacity, what's their authority, what's their influence, at what level should the decision making be made. That I think we need to be very precise and get away with the confusion around words like autonomy subsidiarity and accountability. And I, we don't have to invent it. We've got a range of strong evidence around this. So I'd think about Barbara and Deliverology, just having mentioned Barbara. I'd be looking at some of the uh, Mazzano and other people's work on balanced leadership. I'd be looking at um, the, education, e, the Education Endowment Foundation in England. There's a range. I could list several other sources of evidence. And my challenge to the Commonwealth and the states and to all of us is to get very precise about that. And I can almost imagine a table which says Commonwealth, state, region, network, you know, and so on. That actually leads very nicely into my next question. Um, Julie, you've touched already on the fact that many of the Gonski policies are not in fact new and that state governments have actually been trying to achieve them for some time. So I'm curious, you know, Catherine, you're talking about taking account of the evidence and, and what's already in place. What needs to be done differently to spread that evidence-based practice at scale? You're asking me? Okay, yes. Sorry, I thought yes. you were talking to you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, for, me personally, it's no, for me personally, it's no accident that I um, have spent the last 11 years of my 47 years in paid employment um, 
working what I'd call it the coal face. Uh, because, and before that, I spent, I was the longest attending senior public servant at Makicha when I stopped attending Makicha, and before that at the Health Minister's Conference. So, um, so what needs, what needs, sorry, the question was what needs to happen now? What needs to happen people, now to, okay. to take that evidence and build it at scale? Okay. So, if we want to, I'll go to, uh, I've, got, I've got two specific examples, the University of Melbourne Network of Schools, which I've worked with over the last five years, and the Western Metropolitan Region. And there are, the task for leaders is to make, take a complex, um, a very complex work and, and create enough clarity and simplicity for people to, to, to um, join with it uh, and, and, to, and to get the engagement right. So I don't know anybody, actually. I don't know a single person who does really well when you go and say this, you're failing, you're a poorly performing principal or school or whatever. So we need to think about the, uh, having at, at all times a developmental model, working with children with learning and working with adults uh, to change things. Secondly, the demands we're making on schools now are very different. It isn't just that the evidence is there and they haven't taken it on board. The demands are very different. So we have to, and what Gonski says and what I think I've said is, and I think Julie said, create the conditions where people have the opportunity to learn so they can do the sorts of things we're talking about in terms of using progressions, which is not a minor, just easy, tick the box, get on with it, or um, um, you know whatever we're working on. So I think I'm losing the fine detail. I'd rather you ask someone else a question. <laughs> okay, no back. worries, we'll come back. Michaela, can I ask you that same question? What, what, what needs to be done differently to spread that evidence-based practice at scale? There's an inherent challenge with taking any new idea to scale and asking of people to implement that idea. Uh, as an example, if we look at the curriculum, uh, there's a framework that we use with the curriculum for thinking about how it works in the system it's operating in. At the highest level, you have what's called the intended curriculum, and that's what you see in the curriculum documents, what's written down in words um, in the official documentation. Then you have the implemented curriculum, which is what teachers take and then run in their classroom. And this is their own interpretation based on their experience, based on their knowledge and their skills. And then you have the attained curriculum, which is what students then take from those lessons and what they can show that they can do. Now, the same applies to evidence-based practices. We can spell out what the best evidence-based practices are. Uh, we can be really clear and we can help teachers to identify them, but that will only be part of the picture. Um, like, he's, like Catherine said, we need to also consider the conditions that teachers are working in and how we can support them to be able to make sense of those practices, to be able to learn about it, to be able to collaborate with their colleagues, figure out what makes sense in their context and what needs to be tweaked. Uh, but purely putting out just those practices um, in some sort of documentation or um, asking of teachers to go and run with it on their own can never be enough. And there are two examples that come to mind from either end of the spectrum of what will happen uh, in that situation. At one end, there was a teacher that I spoke with earlier in the year about. Um, she was implementing a particular type of maths practice with her staff. And what she was doing during her maths meetings was bringing in one article, one piece of research at a time, and giving her teachers the space to discuss it, to talk about what it would look like in their classroom, what parts of it were applicable, and what didn't make sense or they didn't ha yet have enough insight into their students on whether this bit of research was useful. So this was an example of a, um, of a school leader really making the most of evidence-based practice and giving teachers time to internalise it. At the other end of the scale, I've worked in a school where um, the principal and school leader here again had the best of intentions. They knew about something called learning intentions, 
which is where basically the teacher is making explicit the intentions for a lesson that students are going to be learning about. Uh, and there's a lot of value in the teacher in uh, thinking through very carefully what the outcomes for a lesson can look like and then helping students to understand that. Um, but unfortunately in the situation what happened was that um, all teachers were instructed to write learning intentions on the board in their classroom. Yep. There wasn't much deeper conversation of what the purpose of that action was or whether that action would even be sufficient for getting towards a desirable outcome. So we need to be able to provide space for teachers to really be able to work with research and then also to understand what data they need to look at from their own classroom to identify the impact of implementing best practices. Uh, we know that evidence is always going to be updated. Uh, we are going through a phase at the moment uh, where there is a lot of excellent um, research out there on cogni cognition, um, how students think and learn and memory and what sort of practices are beneficial for that. And we're still learning a lot about that area. So as soon as that information is given out to teachers, there's going to be someone at a university somewhere who's upgrading it, thinking about a new model and what it can look like in the classroom. Um, and actually, we don't want teachers to continually be 20 years behind on research. We want them to have the tools where they can interpret where they can look at the data that they're collecting in their own classroom and actually help to be at the forefront of the research that's happening. Mm. Julie, did you have anything to add there? Um, I'd say f from an economist perspective, um, <laughs> what was that, sorry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I try to often keep the economist thing sort of low. You never sound like a nice person when you, when you start with that. But, um, in terms of, I mean, it's very, at the moment, at the moment we have a very devolved way of working as a system um, and we expect teachers to do a lot. So we expect, you know, as Michaela was just describing, to implement the curriculum, to look for the right resources to use for their lesson plans, to create their lesson plans, to create certain assessment tasks. Um, a lot of reinventing of the wheel is done by every teacher and by every school, and and uh, a lot can be, you know, that just has trade-offs. Like obviously, putting together your own resources is a really important part of teaching, and the creativity that a lot of teachers enjoy as a part of that is really important. And you would not, you would never not want that to be the case. But at the same time, teachers have huge workloads, and if that also means that they then don't necessarily get as much time to then reflect on their classes and think about how they can, you know, target the, the students who are falling behind in their class very specifically, then that, you know, perhaps that's not the best use of time. So I think the idea of trade-offs in education is one that doesn't get discussed, discussed enough, and there's a lot that could be standardised that's not currently being standardised, mm. um, and I think that would make teachers' roles easier. Um, we also look looked at, um, we did a, a research piece a few years back that was also looking at just how teachers' time is being used outside the classroom by school principals and for other administrative tasks. And, you know, there are some, there are some efficiencies there that could, be, that could be gained as well, that could make a big difference. Um, and if you look at how the best performing systems in the world work, they, you know, teachers, teachers' roles are easier. They have more time for collaborating and having really specific conversations around content and delivery and how to teach, as you know, going to Michaela's example, how to teach um, things in a very specific way and debating that and looking to the evidence on that. Um, and so it's really important that we get a, a, a model that's workable. Um, and I think the second point that I'd make is around, um, at the moment we don't necessarily at scale have there's, there's no system-wide view on pedagogy that is subject-specific in a very granular way. And I think those decisions are always going to be made by every teacher in every classroom, but I think more could be done to have a view on that. If you look at how Singapore, Shanghai and Hong Kong work, they have master teachers and that it's a, it's a body of knowledge, professional knowledge that sits outside of the department and 
is a small number of teachers whose day job it is to really interrogate how subjects are being taught in schools and it's subject specific so you'll have a very small group of people who are responsible for how is science being taught in schools and researching that, looking at the capabilities on the ground, working with research institutions um, to, to bridge that gap, organising the professional learning in those subjects and at the moment we do have more of a focus, for example, in Victoria about bringing coaches into schools and having literacy and learning, um, literacy and numeracy specialists and science specialist teachers. Um, but I don't think that just having, you know, sort of 1,000 specialists working across the system is necessarily the answer. I think there needs to be coherence between those specialists um, and um, really sort of specialist networks of teachers working together that are subject specific. So I think at scale that that's also um, a really big part of the puzzle. Mm. Thank you. Um, we might move on. So far we've sort of focused on what states have already been doing and been trying to achieve. So let's talk through some of the new directions the Gonski 2.0 report has suggested. And um, actually I'd just like to clarify something at this point in the evening. We've been using the phrase practice at scale, improvement at scale, evidence at scale, but I Julie, you mentioned um, that one of the big themes of the Gonski 2.0 report is that we need to avoid a mass model of education. So I just want to be clear that we're talking about two different things here when we talk about those things. You know, um, so we're talking about a focus on student growth and what Gonski refers to as tailored teaching or targeted teaching in Grattan's world. That's right. So that's a whole different kettle of fish to this mass model of education. Yep. Yeah, good. So. Moving into targeted teaching, Michaela, what does targeted teaching actually mean in practice? What are some of the challenges implementation in implementation, especially in maths, given your background? So targeted teaching at a basic level means teaching students at their point of need. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, there's research which we've known about for quite some time now about the large spread of ability that occurs in the average high school maths classroom, about an eight year spread of students' understanding of the curriculum. Uh, and this isn't isolated to just, you know, low socioeconomic or rural parts of the country. This is very common. Um, I was, there was a teacher, a primary teacher I had the chance to speak with last week, and she mentioned that at a primary level, she deals with not quite eight years, but still a very large spread of um, needs that students have. What happens with this is you have students who are coming to class and if they are, let's say you're a year eight student, but you're really, your needs are around a year four level of the curriculum. What that means is that the content that you're being taught it simply won't make sense. Imagine you're learning a new language and someone tries to um, start teaching you about some conditional tense and really you're only ready for days of the week. We know in math specifically that there are a couple of really large concepts that students get introduced to around uh, year four particularly around something called multiplicative thinking, which is where they start to bridge their understanding between multiplication and division, and this leads on to how they understand fractions, decimals, percentages. Uh, there are a lot of students who don't make that bridge. They don't understand what division really is, uh, and this has enormous consequences for their experience in maths beyond that time. So instead of maths being a subject where they sit there and they understand and it makes sense and there are all these connections that they're seeing, they start seeing maths as this arbitrary set of rules and processes. It becomes quite boring and tedious because that's what's happening. It's just rule lessons. And it becomes really tough for them because they've got to cram a lot in their head. They're not able to reason logically about it. Uh, so a common complaint that we hear from students is that Maths is boring, and of course it's boring if it doesn't make sense to them. Actually, what happens for a lot of students is that year after year, they're going through maths class and they're having an experience that doesn't make sense for them. And if we think about ourselves as adults, if we were to go and start learning something new, we wouldn't put up with it for very long 
if it wasn't meaningful for us. So we're actually expecting quite a lot of our students. So targeted teaching means that students who are below curriculum expectation or even performing above that are being given content that's useful and purposeful for them. That's helping them to build confidence and to also extend themselves. And Catherine, from your experience working across many schools, yes. both as a former regional director and in the current Melbourne Uni Schools Network, what do you see that government could be doing better to support targeted teaching? So to go, um, uh, what, uh, what we've just talked about makes total sense to me about what the challenge is. Mm. And then the, the place for government is around how do you create the conditions which enable teachers to explore the range of options, the range of possibilities they might have to target teaching to, the range, to, the, to each child in the class. Now, realistically, they cannot produce a program for each child. There may be some really strong support available to us now technolo through technology and um, access on the internet to support that, and I think Maths Pathways a really fine example of that from my understanding of it. But still, teachers are responsible for every child in the class. We do know there are a number of strategies around how do you know each child, and then um, how do you work in a class with a group, of perhaps grouping children, you, you know, in five different groups for a particular learning that you have the evidence, you know, because you've got some efficient ways of finding out what the children know and can do, which might be using progressions. It might be just conferencing with every kid in a, in a structured way. But to do that, you need to understand and know how to do that and how to set that up and how to manage children in the classroom. And there again, there's heaps of evidence. There are people with expertise in this and, and teachers need the chance to work with these people and then work together within their school to trial those strategies. And teachers need the chance to work together and have time to think about, to be able to um, take in turns perhaps to bring to the um, teaching group that they're working with, uh, say several children that they're struggling with. How do I do this? How do I work on this? So that you're not alone when you find the child who can't read. Your strength is not in teaching children to read because you've never been taught how to do that, by the way, in many cases. Certainly secondary people aren't taught that. So, so, um, so what can the government do to support that? The government has to create the right conditions. And again, they have to be conditions which recognise and respect where people are and, and um, set up structures for professional learning support it in schools, support the leaders so they know how to manage that in schools and to have the right out of school access. So with UMNOS, we're now redesigning the model of UMNOS and we're redesigning it partly because we have a lot of interest from remote schools, from interstate schools, some of whom are participating and even from overseas. But people have to come to Melbourne eight times a year. So we're looking at a different model. We want to hold on to the things that we think matter and they are a relationship building trust so that when you do collaborate, you can actually challenge each other. Um, so that matters. So how do we do that both in face-to-face -face and online? But what's emerging is options and possibilities, partly coming out of um, work with my colleague Sandra who runs the Assessment Research Centre. But so not only do we want teachers to be able to collaborate, but to get just in time uh, professional learning as individuals. So we can look at um, mini MOOCs or micro-credentialing to support individual teachers or, or groups of teachers within a school. So the, the, the layers of, of what you put in place structurally and so that they're doing the right work with the right amount of time are very important. What the state can do, what government can do, is create the conditions so, so that school leaders can implement that kind of approach and also perhaps back up with a, a range of options around professional learning, including um, external consultants who might be able to work in schools. Mm. Um, Julie, creating the right conditions seems to be a strong theme. What, what do you think government should be doing differently to support targeted teaching? Um, create the right conditions? Create the right conditions. <laughs> That's right. I think, I think Catherine said it very nicely. Um, I think perhaps um, what I'd add to that is um, in terms of looking at those conditions, uh, getting down into the detail of, you know, what exactly what are the capabilities of teachers in this area and e exactly how much support do they need. And obviously that's going to vary between schools and whatnot, but not to underestimate that. Um, like there have been programs that have been run where you have, you know, a coach that 
um, that works alongside teachers. Um, we've seen really intensive programs across Australia and then we've seen other programs that are, you know, might be one coach. Some, prog so some programs there'll be one coach per school, some programs will be one coach working across eight schools. And that, that's a big difference. So um, I think sometimes government policies can be quite high level and, you know, oh, we, are, we are supporting teachers, We're, we've got coaching, we've got, well, yeah, how much, in, in what? Um, I think one of the biggest things that teachers struggle with in targeted teaching is um, not only you know, once you've got, you know, using data, but actually then knowing what the next step is in your teaching to, to change that, to then better meet the student's need. That's a really complicated step. So, you know, not only do they need assistance in, in using data, but then also what does that mean in terms of content and delivery and, and whatnot. So. Michaela, one of the ways to support targeted teaching, um, I understand, is through the use of technology. Um, for example, enabling kids to work through material at their own individual pace. Uh, can you talk about when technology has worked well in targeted teaching for maths and when it's not? So I suppose I want to start by saying that technology is a bit like textbooks. Textbooks can be used amazingly well or they can fall flat. You can have some textbooks that have been crafted in completely different ways to others, but also in the implementation of how they work in the classroom. There can be entirely different purposes and ways that students interact with them. Uh, and the same goes for technology. So I do get concerned when I hear um, an, e an extreme from either end of the spectrum that technology is the saviour, we're in the 21st century and, you know, students must engage with technology. But at the same time, it's concerning when we hear uh, technology being entirely removed from the classroom. It can do so much to support teachers, whether it is using particular types of assessments that will give them data, um, whether it is helping students to interact with concepts that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do or be able to access work that is then differentiated. So the question really is to what purpose do we want to put technology to use? How do we want it to implement learning outcomes? How do we want it to um, impact teaching practices? Uh, and we're in a kind of exciting time at the moment because there is a whole lot of enthusiasm about tech there are some horrible programs out there, but there are also some really, really cool ones. And I think we're just starting to see what's possible. And say over the next decade or two, we're going to see even more changes in how technology is helping to support teachers to be able to target teaching. And we possibly don't know half of it yet. Catherine, what's been your experience of technology in schools? Um, it's not, my, no, it's not an area of deep expertise from my point of view, but, but I do want to pick up on, on where you were going, and that is um, the sort of more on the inside-outside. So, and this goes to the notion of autonomy too. So there was a big movement in Victoria several years ago, autonomy. You know, the schools know what to do, just get out of their way. And I love the, that distinction in the Gonski report about structural and professional autonomy because as much as we could clear out the structural autonomy, other, in other words, to my, sometimes, you know, dump it on them and blame them when it goes wrong. I don't want to be ex exaggerating here. But get rid of the, that where, where assistant, assistant's role will be to establish clearly what the shared purpose is and I think the purposes around growth and targeted teaching are fine purposes for all of our children and and um, and then support at a system level support some of the judgments that need to be made about what's rubbish and what isn't in technology or from my point of view I'm very very um, interested in the role of external consultants people who don't actually belong to the school who can come in but anybody can hang out a flag at the moment. And schools, it's hard for them to make judgments about what's a good program or a good way of working and what isn't. And so systems, I've, I've, I'm hoping that Melbourne University will pick up a deliberate um, qualification training for people who want to be consultants who work in and out of schools. 
And what's essential, if you want to make a difference beyond the individual school or the individual classroom, is coherence, a shared language, a shared approach to the way in which you're working. And it's not uh, uh, dictated by the state or the Commonwealth. It needs to be worked through at the school level or at a network level. But, but so the system can support that by, by, by making some judgments and advising schools of what's, what's um, likely to be effective and what isn't. So they're not just out there looking at the various flags being waved in front of them. Mm. Yeah. And sorry, just on that, mm. I completely agree. I think it's, it's horrifying sometimes. Um, I've been to a couple of exhibitions where you see what's being sold to schools. Mm. And I think there is a lot of money that's about to go into schools in Victoria. And I think um, centrally, the department has a real role to play in um, brokering that information barrier that schools have. They can't be expected to try and work out individually what is a good program and what's not. And there is evidence behind what are good programs and what isn't. And so w when we worked in the Western region, what we did was um, we got, we spent a lot of time getting agreement and ownership about what the priorities were. But then we worked with, and the schools appointed a coach within the school with time release for, for reading and for, uh, for numeracy because those were the areas that the schools and the region thought were worth working on. But we also engaged, and, and also the government had given us a number of coaches to work in schools. And we also panelled, we, we tended for coaches who would work in our schools. Now I didn't go and say to the principals, you have to use ours, you can use any you like. But what they did know was ours would be working within the coherent strategy that we were working out together. In fact, they were helping us to design it. And they did a lot of the professional learning of each other, of the coaches and consultants. They met once a month for at least three hours and planned together. They were then available at a set rate for schools to buy in and use to work with their teachers. So that coherence, that clarity about um, um, the particular models we were using was shared. And we got to the point where schools were recruiting teachers from other schools in the Western region because they already knew how we approach reading. And of course how we approach reading was very, very strongly evidence-based, but not prescriptive. Does that make sense? Does it make a difference, um, you've spoken a bit about the coaches and, and, and external consultants, does it make a difference what background they come from as how much of a success the program is? Well, we, t we talk a lot at the moment about what qualities or capabilities those people should have. So they, I think it does matter that they have a teaching background. They have to be people who can establish credibility with a school principal, walk into a school and um, immediately establish a relationship with a school principal, which is ultimately going to involve challenge as well as... Um, you know, stroking people's, it's not about stroking people's ego. So, so and, and they have to be able to connect and work with um, teachers. And by the way, I think what teachers can do is completely underestimated in the broader world. Well, if you can hold a group of 15 year olds in a room for 60 minutes who'd much rather be out doing something else and engage them, that's pretty good interpersonal communication. What's, what's the competency in the social, um, social competency? So, so usually, but not always, though, but they also have to be current and deeply knowledgeable about what the evidence says and how they have to know how to work with teachers so teachers can be efficient as well as effective in targeted teaching, by way of example. Mm. Julie, in your experience, how much do our best teachers already act as coaches for other teachers? Um, I think it varies from state to state. Um, and the one common theme that is coming across is that Sometimes even when uh, in the career structure the top teachers in the school may on paper have the role to teach and, and lead others or as a curriculum head that you're leading the teaching of a certain subject, it, there's not always the time and the space to do that in the school and that might just be come down to resourcing. Um, but also I think then that comes down to active decisions that principals need to make about how they're prioritising teacher time. Um, and I think from what we do know... Um, you know, that, that it does take, to, for someone to do that job seriously and to do it well, it does take quite a bit of time. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think the second thing I'd say is, is similar to, to a point made earlier, that just, um, I think, it's great to have a, um, I, I think in Victoria in particular, there's a lot more coaches that are available to schools. 
Um, but I think the secret to the success of that will be in how they've been recruited, what practices, what specific practices are they promoting? Are they evidence-based? Um, what mechanisms? What mechanisms are in place to stop? a literacy coach actually advocating something that's not evidence-based. Because to me at the moment that's actually not clear. Um, and I think without a stronger sort of central coherent stance on that from the teaching body about what evidence-based practice means in a very specific way, um, that, you know, that that's a risk. So. Mm. Uh, I've got one final question for you all before I throw it open to the audience. So get your thinking caps on and ready for your questions. Um, it, it, just to kind of sum up tonight's discussion, what would be your one minute policy pitch on what governments need to do now following on from 2.0, Konsky 2.0? Julie, I'll start with you. Um, I would, in one minute, I would, um, I'd encourage more streamlining of materials and resources to schools to make teachers' jobs easier and also to more quality assured and high, and high quality products that they, can, that they can use and adapt and be creative with. Um, more regulation of the market, so in terms of the programs and the products being sold to schools. There's, I think there's a lot of promise with certain programs and not just technology programs, but a range of different packages and programs. Um, but there needs to be more quality control over that. Um, and I think, you know, really using the best teachers in our system to spread best practice and recognising subject-specific expertise as being a really important part of that. Excellent. Michaela? I would encourage uh, our policy makers to go and spend a bit of time in schools. Yes. <laughs> that's I a could win. add. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's all I'll say. Um, yeah, it's, I can't encourage it enough. Uh, there is so much that goes on in schools every single day, as Julie mentioned before. There is so much that is expected of teachers. It's incredible. And the amount of work and the amount of impact that teachers have already before we start talking about Gonski 2.0 and targeted teaching is amazing. So an excellent starting point would be to just watch and learn and then think about how the ideas that they're trying to implement uh, sit within what's already going on in schools and in particular how teachers can have the time and space to digest any new ideas that are important for them to start implementing. Mm, great. Catherine? So I would totally endorse <laughs> what Michaela and Julie have said and I'd go back to where I started which is government needs to work out at what level it is, what levers it's got and, and what expertise it's got and therefore where their work should be focused. At the federal level it would be around what, we, what can we do at economies of scale. The, the research institute, how can we engage everybody across the sector in this, but how can we set it up and fund it, and some of the other things we've talked about. And for each level of government to be very confident that they're working productively in the most effective way, pulling the right levers to create the conditions so that teachers can <laughs> work effectively in schools. Excellent, excellent. Okay, let's hear from, from you, our lovely audience. Who's got some questions? Yep, we've got one up the back there. If you can wait for the mic, we are recording the session tonight um, for our podcast channel, so... Hi. Thanks. Um, oh, should be okay. Hello. My question relates to the role of vocational education and training. I know that it's consistently a perennial topic that comes in and out. And I know, <laughs> so from what I understand from the anecdotal evidence is that vocational education and training has a good complementary impact for engaging students who might have fallen off the radar at the early stages when it comes to that literacy and numeracy um, benchmarks and achievements. And so um, it is a great way of engage, or I understand it's a great way of keeping students in the classroom or involved with an educational institution long enough to polish up those skills before they enter into the workplace. Now, given the findings of Gonski and um, the, the views that um, have been, um, sorry, like, and the views that have been forward from that um, new policy, what is the panel's view of how we can engage vocational education and training to complement um, student achievement? Catherine, do you want to take that? No? <laughs> I, I don't feel uh, knowledgeable enough to give you a sensible answer. I've got ideas, but yeah. Anyone else? Julie, it's, it's sort of, uh, VocEd is not something that Grattan's done a lot on, no, is it? it's not particularly with narrow remit. Um, I, think, I think it sounds very sensible. Um, I think 
you know, we want to keep kids in schools as long as we as possible, and I think um, good vocational education programs in schools are really important part of that. Um, uh, but I also think that I think we're kidding ourselves if if that's the only if that's the only way that we see or the main way that we see as engaging those students. I think it's in the teaching of the mainstream subjects as well that we need to be really conscious about engaging all students, and that's you know, that's potentially the biggest challenge. So I'll just say that I've got one child who's in her 30s who I think would have walked out of school by in year 11 if it wasn't for vet music. So, and I used to think at the time, well, if the ET subjects engage kids, why aren't we translating across to all of our subjects, whatever it is that's special about those subjects? So it's a good question and I think it's worth Grattan having a look at. Yeah. <laughs> report. <laughs> Another question? Yep, down the front here. There's a mic on its way. Yeah. I'm going to reminisce having um, started teaching in the 70s and remember mixed ability classrooms, remember curriculum centres that assisted teachers with their pedagogy, remember a time when um, everyone didn't necessarily go through to VCE. There was a technical and other streams of learning and teaching. I think we've lost something and we're trying to reinvent something. But I do remember mixed ability classrooms and teachers doing a lot of professional development around that. This is not a new concept. Targeted teaching, it's what teachers always do. Catherine, any comment on that? So I was thinking not so much about the 70s when I was teaching, but the 50s and 60s when I was a student. So I'm kind of going. But, and one of the things that I remember is that when I went to high school, there were only about 10 high schools in Victoria that went to year 12. We, people keep saying, you know, everybody's been doing this and it hasn't made any difference or it hasn't. The world has changed dramatically and so has the world of education. Um, and so has the world of employment and opportunity. So we are struggling with di a different world and that's important to acknowledge because it, it, it takes you away from this kind of mantra and I think people get their rocks off on deficit, but anyway, it takes you away from this mantra, you know, we've done this, we've going, we've done, and nothing's changed. Um, so I think that's a really important... And I do think that you've reminded me that I think that government needs to get very clear where their expertise is in professional learning and what, what works for teachers' learning. And, and I observe a kind of splintered structural organisation around who's responsible for argument's sake for reading or, or for whatever. So, and we did have curriculum centres and different ways of doing it. I'm not saying that's the way now, but we need to get that in place. Mm. Another question? Yep, up the back. What's the best way to involve teachers and principals in the policy making process when they're already so pressed for time? Yeah, Catherine? So one of the big things we're looking at now in terms of the University of Melbourne network of schools, we started with Professor John Hattie saying to our schools, you are not our guinea pigs, we are not going to use you for research. <coughs> We've now shifted our ground dramatically because it's always been my view that it's a two-way learning. So we're, the schools, we bring expertise in and we work very closely with schools and we get them to work with each other. And the schools are learning from that. But what are we learning from those if experts at implementation, the people who are actually supporting the, the classroom teachers? And so I think um, that kind of partnership between the academy and industry or between the universities and schools is very important and I don't know that government can do that because of their relationship but they can certainly support it and, and definitely the direction we're going in. Michaela? It's one of the most important things um, that needs to happen is bring together different voices in the education community. Uh, I would say that this is something that associations like the Mass Association do particularly well. Uh, our members are not just secondary maths teachers, but they're also primary teachers, early childhood educators, um, uh, t academics who work with pre-service teachers, 
maths academics. Um, and we provide a range of forums to bring these voices together. So for example, we have a very large end of year conference. We have uh, journals that go out to the community every single term. And these journals, uh, the people who are writing for them aren't just academics, but they're also teachers who are giving voice to their practices. So it's actually a really important thing to add to that, that teachers keep sharing what they're doing. And this can be through institutions like the Maths Association, or it can be in informal ways, like setting up a blog or going online on Twitter. There are amazing communities online that are really building up strong communities of practice, sharing what's happening in classrooms, not just across Australia, but all over the world, uh, and engaging in the latest research and discussing what policy means in the classroom. Yeah. Julie, I think, um, I think, I think that's, I think the channels that Michaela's just spoken to are um, exactly the right ones to go to. Um, and I'd say in addition to that, it does strike me that as a profession, teachers don't seem to have as much of a voice compared to other professions. Um, so if you look at, at medicine or health, um, there's, you know, there are really strong groups around medical practice that arc up when the government will do something and that also talk to government. And I guess speaking before about the need for a system-wide view about teaching, um, I think that is missing in terms of the teaching profession having their own collective voice within that. And there is space there in addition to, I think, the teaching associations, which are really important. But I think there is, there is a space for something, for something there. So if you've got any ideas or will to do so, <laughs> I'd encourage you. Get involved. No, we yeah. don't have people all over government telling um, doctors how to do surgery. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Uh, yeah, my question's about data for data's sake. Are testing evidence-based? What are your views on land type for pre-service teachers and NAPLAN as it is at the moment? Sorry, could you repeat the, what was, what's the... What are our views on? On land type, that's the pre-service teacher test they do in their final year in literacy and numeracy, whether it's, you think it's required or or whether it does have a purpose, and also NAPLAN. Michaela? Mm -hmm. I would say that most assessments, I can't generalise for everything that's out there, but have a purpose. Uh, the challenge is when that purpose is misconstrued and the data from that assessment starts to be used in less than desirable ways. What's quite promising at the moment is that education ministers around the country have recognised that NAPLAN data isn't being used in the most productive way, that it is having undesirable effects in what's happening in schools. Uh, so I welcome that conversation to start thinking about, actually, we've got this standardised assessment that happens every couple of years for students. What is it there for? And what can we actually tell from the data in it? Julie, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I just add that um, the evidence shows that the most powerful forms of assessment are those that are used um, and commissioned by teachers in the classroom for the purposes of improving learning and developing along the way, not... Standardised testing is a fundamental part of, like NAPLAN, of any system, just for the system to know where are students at and do we have any problems that we need to get on top of. Um, but NAPLAN should never be a huge part of the education dialogue or focus. Yeah, Catherine? Three things I want to say. First of all, that, that any assessment kind of test is only a small part of what the teachers can use in the classroom and should use. So NAPLAN's not one of them. Secondly, I've always been a supporter of NAPLAN because I worked in the Northern Territory and before NAPLAN, there was a Northern Territory test, and the first year that we actually administered that test, and r rural Aboriginal kids were about a thousand, the total population, we discovered that 18 children reached the minimum standard. We didn't have that information before, and that is compelling information for wanting to do better, right? 
Then I looked at it more carefully. Six of those 18 children were the children of non-Aboriginal teachers working in the remote school, so 12 children. So I always thought it was useful for a system to know that sort of thing. I really like where Patrick Griffin once expounded to me that his notion about what we should be doing with NAPLAN, which is not every child in you know, 3, 5, 7 and 9, but a bit more like, I think, um, pieces, you know, there's a sort a of... A sample. A sample. And, um, and the, the test can be made available to be used in schools if they want to, um, on their own terms and for their own purposes. But you do a sample and each, and each year you can also, his thinking was, probably is, um, I don't want to misquote him, but we can have a look at what other range of tests in other disciplines might be useful and be offering that. So you're using the expertise of, and the, you know, the validity and reliability of a, um, a very carefully constructed test like NAPLAN. So, uh, I, so basically what, what works for teachers in classrooms and you know, uh, the work that we're, they're talking about developing so teachers have got access to a rich bank of assessment materials that they can use at the time that it works for them may do away with the other, per, you know, whatever other people think, whatever people think NAPLAN is for other than information at a system level to inform where to go next. Can I just add one more consideration that we need to keep in mind for any of these sorts of assessments and that's the experience of the user. Yeah. Whether it's a pre-service teacher or the yeah. student, they are having an assessment done to them and we actually need to consider their voice and what the experience is like. Uh, I can never forget my first experience as a teacher of supervising NAPLAN tests. These were year seven students. This was out in rural Victoria. And literally some of these students had never sat still for 45 minutes. It was a very tough experience for them. And they were put into a room for days on end um, and made to seem like this was a very, very serious process, which it was but it possibly wasn't what those students needed at that point in time. So it is a consideration that we need to have at the back of our mind whenever we're thinking about what this test is designed to do and who it's really serving. There was a question in the middle there. Uh, thank you. Um, a lot of the panel discussion so far has been about the current model and about making the current model work better uh, and that's a model that's very much focused on getting people an ATAR or a VCE, if we want to say it's a VCE, but really it's the ATAR. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, is that the right model to be pursuing? And this kind of goes back to the chap at the beginning who was talking about VET. Um, if you look at uh, current research and thinking in Britain, you've got Andrew Adonis and Ken Baker from different sides of the political spectrum are both talking about uh, creating different streams within secondary education. So uh, hypothetically, you might be looking at the academic stream that would look like what we currently do. Uh, but you might also have a vocational stream or an arts stream or a STEM stream. Um, and it's, uh, all of them would have an element of literacy and numeracy in them. So it's not about ditching those uh, skills but it may be about introducing things like uh, project-based learning rather than trying to embed the existing academic subject-based approaches. Um, and, uh, and it's not about creating an A stream and a B stream. They would, they would have parity of esteem. They would all, um, all, all be valid. They would all be relevant for work in, in our economy and, and building a, a Victoria for tomorrow. So I just wonder, is it time to uh, kind of have a paradigm shift and look at, is the secondary model actually working for us? Catherine, are we heading in the right direction with the current model? So I, I have reflected on the fact that though we're talking about getting rid of the, the current model and moving to personalised learning, we're basically talking about schools as they operate at the moment in all this discussion. And I've, I'm not, I'm not a, I have no shame about that. I've had this discussion with my colleagues. I'm working in the present with what's there with the hope of making that work better. There's no question for me that the senior secondary downwards effect really reduces the opportunity to seriously think about completely different models. And I'd rather ask Dean Ashenden up the back than me about what they might look like. But, um, and there are people who are playing in that space already. 
So um, I think it's a really good question and I do think the fact that we're examining senior secondary is a start, but we're not, we are not, I'm not at the moment talking about what really completely different models than the factory model or the mass production model that we've talked about in the past, just being better at doing that well for kids. Julie, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's a really good point that um, what you measure at the, at the end of secondary will drive what is then focused on throughout the rest of schooling. So if we are, serious, if we are seriously talking about moving to a model of education which is not just about academics and it's about broader capabilities and we want to, you know, then there's, there's a question of, well, then why are we still having this very narrow measure in Year 12 of ATAR that really just looks at, um, at academics in a pretty narrow way and there's a lot of discussion around that. I think ATAR, um, I think we do need a measure of, of core skills um, in that as ATAR currently captures. And I think if you're talking about just from a very practical point of view, um, trying a, a mechanism that helps screen uh, for universities to, to then work out who will be able to you know, do well in their courses, I think ATAR is just an efficient um, indicator, but I think there is definitely a case for it's too narrow and we do need broader measures beyond that. My understanding is that, um, yeah, the, the evidence around developing reliable measures beyond that is, is still emerging. So in terms of like critical thinking, for example, or creativity, you know, there's lots of work being done internationally about how do we measure some of those skills and then formalise that. But I think they're just not there yet to be able to roll it out in our schooling system in any, in, in any way. But who's to say in five, ten years' time it, it might change. And Michaela, did you want to...? Yeah, I just wanted to add that at the moment teachers face uh, a conflict in what they're trying to work towards with students. So in the years preceding VCE or HSE, whatever you call it, uh, there is an acknowledgement quite often about teaching students to their point of need, whatever extent that is possible. But then there's the pressure of ATAR, which is essentially a one-size-fits-all model that students are forced to go through particular topics um, in order to achieve particular outcomes. And teachers feel very pressured by what they know they have to get students through in those final two years of schooling. There was a group of teachers last week who actually came together at a PD event to talk specifically about this topic. And they were talking about how they were having to make a compromise for students in year 10, where instead of having supports in place for students to um, be building on, this is math specific, building on the skills that they're up to and helping to support them along learning progressions, they were having to start to teach them basically like rote by rote. Because they knew that in order to be prepared for year 11, that's what was necessary. Uh, it's a really tough situation that teachers are facing, particularly around that year 10 level. Mm. We've got time for just one more question, as long as it's a very quick one. Um, yep, sorry, I, I did promise this lady that I would give her a question. Hi. Um, one of the things that comes up again and again is time. And when Andreas Schleicher was here from um, in the OECD and PISA, he talked about the fact that in other countries, as was even mentioned earlier, there is less student-teacher time necessitated. And I um, think also, if somebody said to me once, in a company, if you were basically retraining people to do an entirely new way of teaching, you would do it. A company would say, we need to retrain people. But we're not doing that. We're doing it sort of informally. So I guess I want to ask the panel, in what way can we first of all break down the myth that that is the most important thing for teachers to do and to understand they need time to be developing these skills, to be learning from other teachers, to be actually working sometimes, as I believe happens in China, with parents who don't understand. So what can be done to really shift that because so much of what all of you are talking about often is because there isn't time. 
Julie, what can um, we do to take yeah, the focus I away from contact time? I think so. Teachers often don't have a lot of control over their time. So in terms of the people who are making decisions over teachers' time, it's the school and it's the system. And until we start to look at some of those structures, um, te you know, teachers will be stuck with the amount of time that they have. Exactly. And I think that comes back to pri how we prioritise resources. Um, you know, it's the most expensive resource. I think teacher salaries take up 90% of the money that goes to schools. So, um, and obviously there's a, there's a number of, of policy, uh, policies around, you know, um, uh, making teachers' jobs easier. So standardising some of the resources that they might use, reducing some of their search costs. Um, things like class size policies is the oldest one, but it's a really important one. So, you know, I think, in Australia, we've had a policy of reducing class sizes. It's really expensive. It's not necessarily the worst policy in the world. It just doesn't really return much um, for the amount that it that it costs. And so, and at the same time, teachers are then, um, you know, being paid the same and ha having to take more classes. So, um, there's some really serious trade-offs that I think we need to consider. And I think, and. The good news is that at a school level, there is a, there is a bit that principals can do themselves without needing to wait for the system to act. But I think um, it's also something that we should be expecting of departmental um, officials. Mm. Michaela, did you have thoughts there? I was just going to touch on what you'd mentioned earlier, Julie, about trade-offs that we can take a step back from looking at what teachers are doing and consider, consider actually what are we taking for granted in their work and what actually is an essential part of teaching. Um, we expect them to be a whole lot. We expect them to be pedagogues, data analysts, um, assessment writers, uh, social workers, all of these things. We're asking quite a bit and possibly some of those things aren't necessary for all teachers all of the times, all of the time. So, um, consideration can be given to where that expertise needs to lie. And a um, bit like you said earlier, Catherine, around leveraging collaboration opportunities and allowing s support from different pockets of the school system so that teachers don't need to keep reinventing the wheel themselves. Catherine, did you want to finish there? Just Shifting briefly. The uh, my understanding is that our teachers, I think, secondary are 1,100 hours face-to-face, -face, and that is considerably higher than more than half of the OECD countries. So it's a very precise, specific issue. And everything, I mean, Michaela's spot on about there's possibilities around efficiencies. What I don't want to do is say, um, is leave it at that. So there are big issues around, around um, how the states think about resourcing schools and what the role of government is. But even now, there are some schools who can make some of those decisions around efficiencies that work so that teachers have more time precisely together, um, you know, to do that planning and teaching and assessment and so on. So it, it, you can't walk away from what is now and, and say it's a problem we can't deal with it, so someone, it's someone else's problem. Sorry. And I'm sure that's not what you're talking about, but it's both. Well, on that note, I would like to draw tonight's event to a close. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, you might be able to grab one of the panellists at the end or continue the conversation on Twitter. Uh, thank you once again to our partner, the State Library of Victoria. Be sure to check out their What's On, either online or pick up a brochure on your way out or see Andrew down the front if you'd like your very own copy of the um, Joy and Data. Um, and... Um, I'd also like to thank our panellists for their um, time tonight, Catherine, Michaela and Julie. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to share your ideas and your expertise tonight. And finally, thanks to you, our audience, for your attention and your time and your fantastic questions. Uh, we hope to see you at another Policy Pitch event soon. Thank you very much.